Hello, Tom Lavecchia here with a very, very special edition of the Armchair NBA. We have Dr. James Bucciolet on the house. Hello, I'm Tom Lavecchia, Armchair MBA podcast. I'm here with Dr. James Buccellato, Associate Professor of Criminology at Wayne State University. University. More of my other podcasts, but on this podcast, I haven't had many doctorates on. I think I only had like one or two. So it's a pleasure uh, that you're here, Dr. James Buccellato. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. And uh, for your audience, if they're unfamiliar with me, don't judge a book by its cover. I'm I'm a rogue social scientist, you know, I'm a punk rock, heavy metal kind of dude, but uh, <laughs> believe it or not, yes, I'm an associate professor of criminology at a research university, believe I it or not. It. I love it. Well, I actually had uh, Dee Snyder on the podcast. I don't know if you were a Twisted Sister guy. That's right. I remember you had that. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, Dee's a friend, a client, and uh, I asked him to come on because I was really kind of interested in his business story. He like busted out like two, three times, and I was really interested on how he kind of, kind of came back. Just a quick shout out to our sponsor, JSV Capital. He actually is rolling out a class um, that is online. Um, I think it's like $4.99. He reduced the fee to do like an online class. You could sign up to be a commercial loan uh, officer. Officer, um, There's no designation needed. You don't need a license. You can do commercial loans. You can do real estate loans, uh, merchant cash events, and so forth. As we say, JSV, loans without the broken bones. So, Dr. Buccellato, we will go ahead and start. So. Um, very recently, as as we all know, those that follow in the genre, um, uh, Matteo um, Messina De Nero was captured by the Italian authorities. So why don't you give a little context and background as to who he is, James? Yeah, I mean, he was uh, a big shot mafioso in uh, in, in Sicily uh, from the, the province of Tropani. And... Um, you know, the, the way I framed it in, in our own podcast um, that I do, I talked about the, the Capo di Tutti Capi, and, and I don't think he was that, like, formally. I don't, I don't think that was a formal title, but I think that f- for all intent and purpose, um, at, 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 you know, up until he was captured, he was the most important and the most powerful um, mafia boss in Sicily, and he comes from um, a very prestigious uh, or good pet mafia pedigree. His father was also a big shot uh, uh, mafioso. And he's been on the lam. denaro has been on the lam for around 30 years. And um, he really, uh, I think the, the origins of his power, not only his pedigree, but the fact that he and his, his father, they sided with Totorina yep. during the, the second great mafia war, which, you know, I know that you've had Totorina's son on, which was, it yeah. was, a, it was a really big deal. That was a fun episode. And they, they sided with Totorina. So they, um, that that uh you know put them in a position of of great power and um so the the power really shifted from palermo to to uh, corleone and and the and the allies of the corleonese and people like denaro and so this was a big deal I and mean, he was one of the most uh, most wanted global crime lords and um but he, he you know he's he's a it was pretty violent dude a uh, pretty serious dude and um, so I, you know, I think this is a this is a big story. Well, you you provide great context, but I want to go like one step further because um, I don't, I don't want to gloss over the fact that the fact that Rihanna took control from the Palermitani was a very big deal, right? People like the five families and other stuff, and there maybe twenty six cities in Palermo. I think there's like twenty five borgatas, and it goes b- kind of by neighborhood, something along those lines. James, is that my off on that or am I close? Yeah, yeah, that that was that's where the most activity is. Um, and that's where you have the most families. I, I don't know the exact number, but it's yeah. something it's something like that, maybe a couple of dozen. Yeah. And um yeah, it's um that it makes sense too, because that's the capital, that's where most of the you know commerce yep. is, and yep. so you have the, the ports there. So it makes sense, and traditionally that was the the you know the the threshold of power, and so it was a big deal politically, geopolitically, when Yes. The Corleonese challenged uh, Corleonese uh, challenged Palermo for hegemony in, on the island because up until that point, I think the, the the families in Palermo, in a lot of ways, were condescending toward 
towards yeah. the uh, the the families that the were in the, yeah. you know, um, right in the in more rural parts of of Sicily. And I think they underestimated uh, mm-hmm. people like Totorina and uh, Provenzano and and uh, the other the other allies um, there. Uh, who was the guy before Rina? Luciano uh, uh, um, Leggio. Leggio, right? So they underestimated them, and it was um, it was a bloody war. And I think that when we talk about a war, in some ways, it's not quite accurate because it was more of a slaughter. It wasn't like, when we talk about war. You think, oh, they lost some guys. They, yeah. they lost guys. And that's not really what happened. Right. Uh, uh, Totorina and his allies, I mean, they wiped out just about everyone. I, I don't think they even took one casualty on their side, to be honest. Yep. I have to double yep. check that, but I don't think they did. So it was more of a slaughter. And and what they were able to do was infiltrate a lot of the other families, especially some of the old guard families in Palermo and in surrounding areas, right. like like yeah. places like Chinese, yeah. and uh, which was where um, – you know, Lamente, Lamente, yeah. Right. And then even places like where my family's from, Castellamare. Yeah. yeah. So they were able to infiltrate those. I think they were able to convince middle, uh, medium and, and lower ranked uh, mafiosi, soldati in those in those families to um, turn against the, the, the old bosses. And yeah. so it really ended up being a, um, a slaughter. And uh, it's, I think it's kind of interesting that the politics of it, how treacherous that world is, because uh, guys like Denaro were able to last the whole time, whereas a lot of the guys who initially sided with Totorina. A lot of them wanted to getting killed. That's right. I was going to say there was a second round of violence, you know, yeah. like a, a, within the next 10 years. Uh, where they right, precisely they turned on a lot of the guys that 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 had sided with them originally, yeah. and so Denaro really had a knack for uh, for you know st- sticking around yeah. uh, and, and not getting caught up in that. So th- this was a major you know geopolitical situation to have the power shift from from Palermo, and and I think I'd be curious to see what what you think because I know you monitor this too. Yeah. Um, my sense is that from what I've been reading. That for for a while now, the power has started to shift back to Palermo, yeah. and I think now with Denaro out of the way, that that might crystallize that. Correct, correct. That it might finalize that back to the old to the old families. Yeah, and and, and like I said, there's a, it's like for guys like us, like we could stop now and unpack for like three hours what you just said in the last fifteen seconds. Because the the yeah you know, the power was in Palermo and Chinese near the airport. Uh, Battalamente um, uh, built uh, uh, was it Puntarasi? I think it was. Uh, yeah. Or I don't yeah. know. Well, now I think it's Falcone Borsellino. Um, Frank Pirolino calls it. They should have called it the, the Battalamente Airport. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. You because... know, uh, so so, but real quick, so so I want to give some context because a lot of the folks. There are some people like Don Vito Cassiofero, great name. Um, some people know a little bit more of the other side, but a lot of the people are still like the five families here. Um, and I want you to maybe shed some light. And this is my opinion, and you may echo or you may disagree. I'm not knocking a made guy here. I'm not knocking made guys here. I, when I told John Panisi, the mafia has a lower acceptance rate than Harvard statistically. So he was in a, <laughs> an elite club, right? Sure. Pretty but exclusive. <laughs> to be made over there is harder and a bigger deal than being made over here. Agree or disagree? Um, I think there are so many variables. It's a, it's a it's a tough call. Um, I would say that it's more it's more exclusive in Sicily because I think in the United States, if you're a good earner, um, yeah. you can you can probably Correct. make your way into it. Um, in Sicily, I think there are. Even if you're a good earner, I think the the pedigree and those kind of um, legacy lineage, lineage, right, right. I think that carries more weight in yeah. Sicily than, and also there's just not as many spots open. Like when when you when we talk about how like Palermo, there are all those families, not only in Palermo but surrounding Palermo. Correct. Um, you know, most of these families are not that large. Nope. I, I mean, in some cases, you have like a dozen a dozen guys. Yep. So that that also, as opposed to New York, where you can have anywhere from a hundred to three hundred, you know, members. Yep. So, um, and again, you know, that, that's that's not easy to get into those families either. But right, right. 
but I would say, you know, I, I'm not, I don't know if it's a perfect, we can do a perfect comparative analysis, but just as if you put me on the spot, I would say it's more uh, difficile, more difficult to, uh, to, to, to make it in Sicily. Well, I would say though, and I, and I was going to, you read my mind, uh, James, is the thing, and I, you know, you, you know, the show, I like to cover the business end of things and, 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 and from the business end of Sicilian coast in Austria, you know, I, I asked multiple people, you know, that, that, you know, Tony Nicasso, the, you know, re reputable people. I don't think the Crowley and essay cracked 75. I, I, I like that would be like a lot. Like, so, so what happens is you have, I think between, and obviously it ranges, let's say a range of 3000 to 5,000 made men on this Island. At one point, these 5,000 guys were responsible for arguably about 15, 20 billion dollars a year in gross revenue. That's insane from a per person, you know, per revenue amount. So if you could give some context and color too, um, you know, obviously, you know, uh, they built Palermo, which was had a billion dollar run. I think the, the drugs kind of funneled it and then brought the economy up. But give us a little bit about like the economic power, the eco mafia. How is the old mafia making money and how are they making money today? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I mean, I'll, I'll say one thing. I mean, just just to go back to something you mentioned, and then then I'll, I'll I'll answer that more directly. But even when you talk about the the influence, economic influence, the fact that the airport is is built in uh, Chinese, um, if you've ever been in there, it's that's not where an airport should be in terms right. of like right. in terms of design. Yeah. And it's kind of a white knuckle flight when you when yep. you fly in because it yep. looks like you're flying into the mountains, and you're like, Jesus, I hope there's an airport, there's a runway here yep. at some point in the, the last second. It, it it you know you see it and you're like, whoa, okay, I'm glad that's there. So, but that just shows you like that's where he Badalamente wanted it, and uh, he didn't really care about design or yep. architecture. Like this is where we're going to put it, figure it out. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the old the old school dons were um, a, a lot of it was extortion. You know, I think that was in the early years was always the 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 bread and butter. Yeah, like any kind of economic activity, you whether it was <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, right. So either whether it was illicit or just legitimate yeah. economic uh, commerce, you had to pay. Um, you know, to the, kick up to the bosses. So I think extortion was always the um, the main one, and then the. Um, you know the produce rackets. You know Badalamenti. They were they were big into that. Um, in terms of monopolies, yeah. having monopolies over legitimate industries. Correct. And uh, that was that was a big money maker. And then I would say one of the earliest examples of like the more what we think of as illicit trafficking was uh, bootleg uh, cigarettes. Yes. And yeah. um, you know, cigarettes are huge. That's how, that's cigarettes. How yeah. the, uh, sorry to cut you up, Jim. That's yeah, no, go ahead. The, the SCU on the map. The Sacra yeah, well, and the Camorra that put them on the map. Yeah, yeah, that was so they were all, all right, not just Cosa Nostra. The, all those groups were making a lot of money, and yeah. what the reason why I think that's significant is a lot of the techniques and the and the distribution routes that they were using yeah. became they had that infrastructure for when they moved to narcotics, where narcotics became. Right, right. they already had some of those smuggling uh, techniques and whatever yeah. down pat because yeah. because they were trafficking cigarettes, and then. And then I would say the next most important phase of economic development for Cosa Nostra on, on the island was, as you point out, the, the getting into the construction rackets. I yep. think that was maybe just as important as the narcotics, um, because if you go to if you go to Palermo now, it's 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 still a beautiful city in my opinion, but but it's not as beautiful as it used to be because yep. they they overdeveloped uh, the city, Correct. ripped out some of the citrus groves. Yeah. developed on some of the coastal properties that were really majestic. And now there's like, you know, apartment, yeah. <laughs> apartment complexes and things. And it's, it's kind of, you know, what we think of as like blight, I think. Yeah. So, but the, but the construction rackets were really important because um, a, they were able to launder their money. That was a good way for them to, to launder their money was through the construction rackets. And it was back to the, to the monopoly. Like it, it also um, gave them access to political power. You know, um, the the construction industry, especially in Palermo, was really intertwined with the political establishment Correct. there. So that was important. And um, and then, of course, then I think by the, the late 70s, early 80s is when, you know, narcotics trafficking really. I mean, they were they, they were always trafficking narcotics, to at least in a lot of ways, going back to post-World War II. But it, it didn't become a staple, I would say, until probably the late 70s, uh, early 80s.
Yeah. Well, okay. So, so one of the things that I want to kind of touch on also is, um, well, the construction contracts were, you know, in Italy, everything is, is blue tape and all that kind of stuff. Hey, Tony, uh, as blue, uh, uh, red tape, sorry. And, uh, you know, everything's a, a license and a charter and everything else. And the construction uh, permits for all, all of Sicily or Palermo or wherever it was, was controlled by five people, four of which were never in construction. And I think three were over 80. <laughs> so these yeah. were like plants for the mafia, just rubber stamping their projects for overdevelopment. And just to give some top context and numbers, um, Totorina, and this, and I, you know, I'd be hard pressed to say that's all he had. But he had $125 million taken away from him um, um, back then, right? Uh, and then on top of it, and, 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 and James, help me with this if, if you don't mind. I think they confiscated a billion dollars from De Niro twice. I believe something along those lines. Am I am I far off on that? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm afraid I don't. I don't really have insight into yeah. that. Um, my, my, I was always under the impression that when they would talk about Denaro's wealth, that a lot of it was was on paper. You know, it wasn't yeah. necessarily like he I mean, had they're, they're like you know, a bank account, but you know, buildings right. and companies and whatever. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it wouldn't surprise me if he. You know, I don't know about. I don't know about to that extent, but. Certainly, he was a pretty wealthy individual. But you know what's what's intriguing about that is with him and especially Provenzano and Totorina, these guys were extraordinarily wealthy, but they didn't live like kingpins. Correct. Like these are especially Provenzano and Totorina yeah. were still very much like uh, you know guys in the hills, right? <laughs> and uh, and then then they were on the lam, so they they had they especially were living in these Spartan conditions, so. Um, it's not like these guys were in these opulent uh mansions and living like Pablo Escobar on a, yep. <laughs> you know, like on an estate. So um I think it was a lot of it was about obviously they wanted financial wealth, but a lot of it was about power. Like like it, you know, you, you can't put a price tag on the amount of power that those guys were um well, I you know, um I you know I in interviewed Pablo Escobar's wife. Right. Okay. Yeah. I was working on this, and I'll share it. It, it. It's not that it fell through. It just the timing wasn't right. I was trying to get Juan Pablo, you know, Pablo Escobar Jr. and Salvo Jr. on a podcast together. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> that's not like. You know yeah. I mean? So so all right. Now the other part is there was a little bit of a philosophical difference as well, and there's two parts to it. I won't go over the first part of my opinion was in Palermo they felt like oh we're part of the establishment we're going to we're going to talk to um the politicians we're like you know equal to them or maybe put them on a higher scale where Totodin is like no 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 they work for us we are the higher power here we're the omni donori the, the uh, honored society uh, uh men of honor so give us a little bit about like there also was a psychological shift in Cosa Nostra when the power shifted over to the Corleonese. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was the um, uh, infamous um, incident where the uh, um, prime minister in Italia, um, why his name is, uh, is escaping me right now. The, uh, or Andriotti? Um, uh, Andriotti, the yeah. early, earlier. Oh, I was corrupt as a $3 yeah, bill. Yeah. So. Where he, where he confronted, the mafia about yeah. the assassination of Presante Mattarella. Yeah. And um, he said, you know, you can't fucking do that. And, and the mafia's response was, you don't, you don't tell us what, you don't tell us what we can and can't do. We tell you, we tell you what, what, what we can do. And that was a real, like, I think uh, an important symbolic kind of that, that this was no longer, you, you're no longer uh, the puppet masters here. Like we, yeah. we call the shots now. And that became especially entrenched that attitude with Totorina because yeah. he would he would kill you i mean he had no no problem killing prosecutors police um you know uh journalists uh members of parliament whatever i mean he, he had right. no no compunction whatsoever about so i mean in a lot of ways it was um it was a war against the state and um but it's it's not it's not terrorism in a conventional sense because we hear this now with like Mexico yeah. and this term narco terrorism. 
And I understand it, it, it. It's terroristic in the sense of it's to instill fear in the population. So I right. agree with that. And I, and I think Totorina was doing that too. But yeah. it's not terrorism in the sense of they're not interested in state capture. Right. I don't think Tota like Pablo Escobar like wanted you know why actually he was a member of Parliament at one point like he wanted to be the state and that's what you see right. with a group like ISIS right they actually want to capture the state Correct. and be the be the political entity but I think with Totorina and with the cartels in Mexico they just want the state to leave them alone they just yeah. want the state to stop confiscating their money and yeah. stop and stop intervening with their drug trafficking and um, to the extent that the state pushes back. You know, Totorina had no problem, um, you know, killing generals, um, other people that were, you know, yeah, anti-mafia. No, yes, yes, I think was a, so the yep. general, the Christian Democrats. That's right. Uh, he killed some some people that way uh, from the prominent political party uh, in Sicily. The, the, yeah. other, the other part I wanted to touch on, too, philosophically, um, they felt like when when they got Falcone and Borsellino and they were making headway, obviously, maxi trial, et cetera. Um, um, they created super prosecutors. So they're like, great, we're just going to create a super mafia. So they create, like, there essentially was a uh, kind of a militant wing to Cosa Nostra, if you will, bomb experts, some tactical. They're not as much as, like, the cartels and stuff. But I think philosophically, they wanted to create, like, kind of a super mafia that had the military might, hence the bombings in, you know, Florence and, and, and Rome and Milan. Uh, talk a little bit about that, James, in your opinion. Was that the right strategy? And give us, you know, from his standpoint and, and, and tell us what you think about that. Well, I think, you know, it, in real time, it, it's it's difficult to, to judge what, you know, I, I mean, we could say from a, from a, you know, humanitarian perspective, of course, it was a terrible yeah, thing to yeah. do. But if we're talking about just from like, uh, you know, let's, let's like as if we're an organized crime group, yeah. you know, in real time, it's difficult to judge. But I certainly think now when we look back on it, it was a it was a poor strategy because um, it, it generated really bad public relations Correct. for I mean because up until that point uh, the mafia for the most part was still like unspoken of like you weren't yeah. even allowed to acknowledge it you knew right. everyone knew it was there right. but um, and and to the extent that you did acknowledge it it was usually with the a sense of reverence and you know these guys are looking out for us in the Correct. community right. or in the neighborhood and. Um, you know, um, everyone just kind of minds their own business and, and, you know, they get do their thing and, and we can go about and do our thing. And even if there's corruption, you know, as long as not a lot of people are getting killed. And once they started killing, you know, uh, prosecutors and again, cops and others in the yeah. streets, not just guys that disappeared, but just correct, you know, correct. public executions. I really think that the, the public opinion started to turn that, that this is, this is, this is not some, uh, romantic, uh, you know, yeah. gentlemen's racketeering uh, going on here. These are, th th this is like, again, it's like a violence against the state. Correct. And so I think that most successful crime organizations need some type of um, compliance with the community or some, some type of like tacit consent from yes. the community um, to, to function to, and to thrive. Yeah. And once you start, once you start to, to lose that, you know, public opinion starts to turn against you, um, then, then I think uh, you're, you're going to have the kind of problems they have where, you know, a lot of those guys either had to go on the lam or were prosecuted, you know? Well, so go, talk about going on the lam. So we've kind of followed the transition, right? You had um, Re Rina uh, in 93, um, Provenzano, I think in 06, I think he got captured. Um, and then, um, and then uh, Rita died in, you know, 17, uh, but, you know, and I don't think he, he got some, I don't think he wielded a lot of power wise in jail. I think he tried to do some stuff, but, but so essentially De Niro is allegedly for a while, the heir apparent, right. Um, and has been on the run for 30 years. Now he was hiding in plain sight. So, so that kind of lends me to believe that there had to been, there's kind of three levels of involvement. There's the street level people, uh, uh, local politicians, cops, that kind of stuff. You get to the mid level, maybe like a state policeman looks out for him. But then you get to that third tier share level, like a Salvo Lima, who's a fabric of you know society and, and business and, and and politics and some high level politicians and so forth. They had to be in on it. Like you don't just hide in plain sight like that. So give me like what what 
is kind of unfolding there, and what whether it's a prediction or, or a thought or analysis, how did he hide in plain sight so, for so long? Yeah, that's the exact way that I framed it was hiding in plain sight. I found I, I really find it difficult to believe that in today's age with drones and snitches yeah. and survey, uh, you know, advanced surveillance techniques, um, wiretaps, I, I, I find it very difficult to believe that the state had no idea <laughs> that, that that's where yeah. he is. Because uh, my understanding is he has traveled a bit, but for the most part, he's been holding it down yeah. in, that, in that area. So I find it difficult to believe. I think he was hiding in plain sight. And so my, my guess is that that the state, uh, that it was happening at a few different levels. At, at one level, I think there was not this robust um, attempt, uh, robust effort to, to find him in the first place. But that in and of itself is not enough. I agree with you. You also need people on the ground. Um, so it's one thing for the for the feds to maybe look the other way, but you also need you know people on the ground floor you know to, right. to, to help you. And I agree with you that that's going to be people in the in the in the community, local uh, prominent business people. Yeah. So I, I shouldn't say local business because I you know not not like the you know the, the local restaurant sure. owner, but uh, you need like you know the prominent business yeah. you know the 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 major players in the area, yeah. and also um, I suspect it could be. I, I'm just speculating. I, I don't have any like direct insight on this, so I'm not you know d- please don't uh, say that I, I I'm saying this for sure. But we know in some cases there's uh, religious leaders too that that were protecting these guys. You know they could the the church could provide coverage. Right. You know? cover for some of these guys but i think yeah definitely local law enforcement um and probably uh enforcement at the uh you know provincial level um was was compromised um and so then then you get to the the question of okay so then how did he then why if that's the case why does it come to an end uh yeah. i had i had a i put out a hypothesis i i haven't been able to collect enough data to, to test it yeah. But my hypothesis was that someone gave him up. Someone, someone gave him up in in this kind of um, arrangement with uh, the the state that okay, you can't just let Denaro go out there forever and not be caught. Like at some point, it's too, it's ridiculous. It's embarrassing. He's got to be, you know. Um, so let's um, we got to bring him in. You're going to be the boss now. We'll yep. look the other way, at least for a while, while you ascend. Now, that's just a hypothesis on, on my I, – I don't know if that's true, but it wouldn't surprise me. We know that that's happened before. I, you know, Even with the cartels, we know right. that that happens. Guys give each other up you know, to climb the ladder. Um, the, other, the other possibility is that he just um, – because of his cancer treatments, he was just he – was, he was becoming too visible, and it was becoming too – becoming almost impossible for the state to be like we don't see anything (laughs) right right so and that uh it it just became too obvious um so it may not be as much skullduggery as like i'm you know i'm saying maybe someone gave him up uh it may have been just too obvious because of his he needed that medical treatment they couldn't they really couldn't conceal it anymore well you and you and i are aligned on that so thank god i'm not uh hey frank i'm not too tinfoil hat-ish on this (laughs) Um, I believe there was a direct horse trade. Um, there was a higher power, which we'll get into in a second when we get your opinion, a higher power. Um, and they said, okay, you know what? You know, Maloney came in, she needed a win and is like, Hey, you know, we got to find this guy or we know this, where this guy is. Can we bring him in? Um, I just found it odd that she was at the Falcone um, um, memorial site, like the next day, her schedule is booked out probably four years in advance. You don't just go to Sicily, not like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, then, and, and like to this day, and don't laugh at me, uh, uh, people that are watching this, but I know James may echo this. When you travel to Sicily, like even now, like they might weigh in with the local bosses to be like, hey, we're coming or hey, like, you know, can we come? <laughs> like yeah. there's still some of that going on. So I just don't buy that. Um, that, you know, like he just got caught. I think it was a horse trading going on. I think he wore it as welcome. I think he was sick, whether he was a sacrificial lamb. He's like, all right, I had a good run. Let me in. Or whether he kind of got betrayed by higher power. So which brings me to my next thing. Now, 
this is an area that is I I can't find a lot on it. I would like I like to think Bouchetta's covered on it a little bit in God's Banker. Um, Sindona kind of covered a little bit. There's a theory similar to the Indraga, you know, they have a higher than Lasanta, the invisible, powerful people. There's a belief of a high mafia. And these are judges, lawyers, politicians. They were inducted. They're untouchable. They're part of the fabric, kind of like a Salvo Lima, kind of like those guys, but in greater numbers and actually mafiosi, but kind of like white collar mafiosi that are higher than Rena. And I think it was John Panisi who talked about, he kept saying they, they, they. I don't know if it was his show or another show talked about uh, they need to do this, meaning Totorina. I think there's a high mafia. Where do you land on that? You studied this up way more than I did. You're much smarter than I. Where do you land on that? Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely – and we're, we're talking about the Masons. That's really yeah, in yeah. Sicily and Italy. That That's what we're talking about. And I, and I agree with that. And I, I actually – at this point, I don't think it's conspiracy theory. I I, I mean, I, I think it's uh, – others oh, uh, – Frank or – uh, Paisano. <laughs> I actually have to, someone emailed me about a, a, some, a project to maybe work on with Frank. I gotta, I nice. gotta get, get back to him. I've been uh, busy. Apologize. Me dispiace. Frank, I, I, it was my wake up call. It was a rough morning. I'll, I'll tell you about it uh, tomorrow. There's a reason yeah. why I was busy, but yeah. Um, but, I, but yeah, I do. I, I, so I don't think it's conspiracy theory at this point. I think it's pretty well documented in, par, in even in parliamentary investigations yeah. in, in yeah. Italy that the Masonic lodges were real, that they were. Um, uh, and most of the members of this, what we would think of like upper tier mafia versus lower tier mafia, yeah. the upper tier mafia were um, judges, industrialists, yeah. Um, uh, um, members of the clergy, yep. uh, members of the intelligence community, uh, members of the military industrial complex. And uh, I absolutely think that they were, they had this um, agreement or, or alliance, however you want to think of it, maybe partnership, maybe partnership's not the right word, but definitely yeah. some type of network in place with Cosa Nostra. Yeah. And I think that, um, a lot of that, and this is where you know think, things get a little bit more murky. Is I think there's some evidence that U.S. and other European allies were knew about this, and, yeah. and um, um, especially when you start talking about the military industrial complex, right? I mean, yep. uh, those those kind of players in Italy are all connected to the CIA, right? Yep. And and I, I don't want to get too like you're saying tinfoil hat here, yeah. uh, but. Um, here, but uh, I, I think that that these guys were were probably more powerful than Cosa Nostra, uh, but they still needed each other. I think right. it was a, a very what would be the term like symbiotic relation, yeah, relationship. Yeah, kind of, like, think, kind, you know. of kind of like um, uh, parallel ecosystems. Maybe not the same ecosystem, but kind of, you know. Yeah, yeah, because I think the. Um, the uh, the Cosa Nostra needed the 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 I think it was P two I think that was the name of the main yeah, lodge. Or jelly. Yeah. Right. Right. So that well, no, they but, needed them. No, yeah. No, go no, ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Wherever there's like a conspiracy, John Gambino, um, the the Cosa Nostra, Indragada, this guy shows up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Crazy he's guy. he's a he's a very um, mysterious guy. Um, he's all over the place. Connected to the Vatican, connected, yep. Yep. connected to probably U.S. intelligence yep. agencies. Yep. Um, so they they needed those guys, Cosa Nostra, to rein in the prosecutors and 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 rein in the anti mafia judges. And then I think the the other guys they needed Cosa Nostra to push buttons on guys when, yeah. when, when you know when people get out of line of the political yeah. establishment. Um, we know the, you know, Cosa Nostra was used to like neutralize labor unions and, you know, socialist groups and things like that. Like yeah. the, 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 the big, the power elite in Italy definitely did not want like land reform or anything like that. You Correct. Know? What, um, cause I want to, we're going to get into where like the U.S. Amici Nostra comes in and we'll talk about the, the, the Indraga a little bit as well. Um, but the mafia makes your money a lot differently now. And one of the areas that, um, Massimo uh, De Niro was involved with where he made his money was the eco mafia, the, the wind turbines, and so forth. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, that's becoming uh, well, has been for a while a, a big money maker for the Italian mafia groups, not just Cosa Nostra. And um, it's actually really 
I think depressing for those of us who like, you know, care about the ecology and care about the environment oh, yeah. that, that, um, first of all, hardly any of the recycling is actually like happening over there. They're just dumping most of that. And I, I know there's some problems with recycling even here that yeah. some of it's not as recyclable as we think. I, I yeah, understand right. the, the no, science. Not, no, nowhere near like in Campania. Right. Disaster. Right. Exactly. Where they're just, where they're just dumping it, but they're also doing it with, with uh, toxic chemicals too. Um, just, just dumping things. And um, it, you know, it's, it's horrible for, it's horrible for, because remember, not only is it just horrible for like, you know, people's health, but a lot of the um, economics of this area is, uh, you know, um, uh, Buffalo mozzarella and yeah. uh, Pomodori and like, you know, t t traditional agricultural um, economy. And if you're dumping all this toxic shit all over the place, Yep. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's good for the olive oil and yeah. <laughs> you know, foreign things. tourism. Yeah, uh, uh, ag agro, agro, uh, agriculture. Yeah, um, agro yep. tourism. Like you want to go to Tuscany and have a nice wine. Meanwhile, like your face starts glowing. Um, yeah, you know, hundred percent. Yeah, it's 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 not it's it's uh, it's not good in a lot of different ways. Well, so but you know, I, I, it highlights so to me, in my opinion the involvement, evolvement of uh if that's a word <laughs> the evol evolving nature of uh sin cosa nostra so now you know i wish we had sky here for this part and or frank as well not not that you're not the expert i'm just saying yeah, like <laughs> i would love to have them on at a later time what did all this mean for us cosa nostra because my my opinion was the you know by what mid 80s early 90s the um you know calling us they took over pizza connections gone like, I don't think U.S. was part of the strategy for the Corleonese. I even asked Salvo. He had no relatives here, or he did, but he couldn't really speak of it. But what I'm saying is, Totorino wasn't plugged into the U.S. at all. So what, like, and then later on, like, it kind of swung back. The pendulum swung back a little bit. Operation New Bridge and stuff. So give us, like, where the American Mafia fits in on all this from Reno all the way to today. Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways there was even, if I may be so bold, uh, you know, I can say this publicly now because he's dead, but Totorina, I think there was um, a naivete in some ways too about him. I mean, he thought, remember the thing, he thought like John Gotti was like bigger than the president. Yeah. And uh, you know, so yeah. I think there was a fundamental misunderstanding uh, on his part because yeah. he was not the cosmopolitan mafiosi like yeah. like the Inzerillos and the Gambinos and DiMaggio's yeah. and Bettelementes. Yeah. Right, who had who had family members who were made guys in the United States and were tra and were traveling back and forth, Bonventre and Castellamare, and those families were very Cosmo, and right. um, so they they were um, you know they they were more familiar with I think how things were operating in the United States. I don't think the Corleonese guys were, and so um, you know I, I think it did. Um, I, I think you know I think the the, the heroin pipeline was was still in place. Um, I just think that the guys that they didn't kill, uh, they left in place to the guys that still had those American contacts. Remember, I mean, that you know, the Cherry Hill Gambinos were still operating and they still that's, had their contacts in Sicily, but that's where that's where I have a hole, right? Where um, I don't know if that sounded right, <laughs> that's where <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not connected. And, and, and I yeah. guess, Frank, two questions give me three different answers. So, after the pizza connection, here's what I don't get. They put away the losing team, right? They, like, 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 Battle of Mente wasn't really a drug dealer. Like he goes to, you know, Brazil. He gets plugged in with friggin' uh, the Mujahideen, and he starts selling. That gets shut down. That was a losing team for, like, the Cosa Nostra. What I don't get is the Cherry Hill Gambinos were getting it from Sicily. In my opinion, they were getting it from Palermo. When they took, when they took over, Rina's like, you're buying from us, and, you know, you'd have a choice. So they bought them from from um, Italy, and I don't think that pipeline ever really got disrupted to this day. And I think that's what they were fighting over. But what I don't get, so for example, when um, John Gabino allegedly went to go meet with Totorino, and they sat down, and he's like, "Listen, you know, we got, you know, you got to do business with me, blah blah blah, or whatever the, the deal they made." And I think Totorino is like, "All right, you know what? I'll let the Inzarellos stay there, but those two got to go." Like Sammy and his store. Now, Totorina wanted, I think, Pietro and Zarello and the other. Antonino. Antonino, Antonino was Zarello. killed. In, in Jersey, Jersey, they were killed. Yeah. He wanted them to go because he just needed those, like, two more licks. You, you know what I mean? So yeah. then after that, I don't have a flavor or understanding 
of the pipeline. They put away the losing the, the Pizza Connection guys essentially was the losing team. Was the Balamente guys along with the Badano guys. But what about the Gambino? What about the Lucchese? What about the Harlem guys? Where were they getting their drugs from? They had to be getting it from Palermo. And I still think that they do to this day. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree, especially like, like, so the, the, the laboratories where they were processing the morphine, um, they were, uh, I mean, th those, those didn't get disrupted just Correct. because, just because the, the local boss might've been killed by, by the, the guys in Corleone. Uh, that, that doesn't mean the laboratory was gone. Yeah, I saw the the person, first, I'll sort of Joe instead of uh, uh, yeah. you know, whoever. Yeah, right. no, hundred percent. Yeah, so so I agree with you. It it didn't. Um, I don't think it was. I think there was little, if any, uh, disruption, and um, I think the, that that both sides were basically uh, fine with that. I mean, you know, the, what do they say? Like in the Godfather, business not personal, because the the two in zero. Um, and Zerillos who were killed in Jersey, they were set up by their own family members. I mean, yeah, you want to I, talk I, about some godfather tragic shit. I mean, that's how they were set up by their own, literally their own, their own relatives, blood yeah. relatives, because yeah. that was, that was, as you point out, that was non-negotiable um, with Totorina. And he said, well, we'll let the rest of them stay there. But those two, that's non-negotiable. Yeah. And they, and they gave them up. And Castellano was related to those guys too. Well, and, Cast you know, Cast real quick, but a good point real quick. Castellano had to prove that hit. I don't think he really had a choice. I don't think he was fearful. No. But I just think, like, the old school mentality was, oh, Sicily needs this. Let's just do this. I may need a favor and out of respect for Toto or whoever. So that part's easy, right? So he signs off on it. They probably weren't bigger. You know, whatever reason he signs yeah. off, right? Yeah. But then what I don't get is, and I did a show on this. Um, you, did you ever, the, is it Rosario Naimo? Did that name ever come across here? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. He was re his guy here. Right. He got made by the Lucchese's. I believe the reason was because there's no way the Gambinos could make them because there were so many Anzarellos there. Like, oh, I just yeah. killed your whole family. Oh, let's sit down and break bread. So it makes sense. And it's funny because I used to ask John, I I believe the Lucchese's were like the least Sicilian family, in my opinion. Like the least, I don't know, after the time Lucchese, of course, but I'm yeah. just saying the least like other side guys. Like I don't think they even had a full crew of zips just is my opinion but, but no my, I, I agree the reason why i was shaking right. my head is because i yeah. i don't the Columbos i would put put there too, uh, you're, right, you're right you're right my you bad know. you're right you're right zero brooklynites right i would say yeah. i would say least italian 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 right is colombo and then lucchese yeah right. that right yeah that would say yeah for sure I, I think there's no question about that good point so 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 nemo's here and and you know, he was an informant. I know you got to take their their testimonies with you know or, or interviews with a grain of salt. But supposedly Totorina was going to kill Gotti because he didn't have anybody here. Castellano was essentially his last guy, and the Gambinos were always plugged in with Palermo. The Genovese, not so much as you know. I mean, the other families just well, maybe the Bananos a little bit, but they were more where you're from. Um, uh, families from. So I feel like I feel like that might have been when there was a sea change where like they were kind of connected trans transatlantically and then not. But then later on, that pendulum kind of swung the other way. And again, I'm, I don't like to talk about current guys, but it's a story that was public about how Ernie Grillo went to Sicily and they kind of rolled out the red carpet. Did you guys cover that at all? Uh, no, I mean we haven't we haven't talked about that too much. Not that aspect of it. I mean we we did the. Um, uh, I'm looking at the, the comments there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't uh yeah, Frank, yeah, Frank and I have talked about that. It, it's more of like uh breaking bad, like in a you know, a tra a trailer uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's not it's not like uh you know well, uh sorry. Pfizer, <laughs> Pfizer pharmaceutical uh, high tech <laughs> laboratory. Yeah, fair point, fair point, Um yeah, but um but uh yeah, I mean, um I, I think that I think a lot of the transatlantic stuff was just over Gotti's head. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I, if I can say that, um, I, and, and, and one, one, like one of the, the political gestures that I always thought was very interesting was we know that a lot of the time when John Gotti had to meet with John Gambino, John Gotti went to him. He yeah. went, he went to, he went to, uh, John's club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that was interesting because that's not John Gotti style, right? Like he right. liked to hold court and summon people <laughs> to come right. to him. Right. And so I, I always thought that that was very telling politically. Yeah. That Gotti recognized that this was this this aspect of his organization was uh, more complicated, maybe than 
than the other parts where he was just basically muscling in on it uh, on everybody. He couldn't really pull that with the transatlantic guys. And uh, there's the there's the famous uh, wiretaps where John Gotti's complaining about the Sicilians about how they um, they uh, they speak English until you start talking about how much they have to kick up, and then <laughs> all of a sudden they don't understand English. <laughs> uh, well, Sammy Sammy went on record in his testimony, I believe, as well as on his show when they sat down and strategized after they took over and they were they were war gaming. They're like, who has the power? The political power, the financial power, the manpower. Who do we have to look out for? And of the 26 captains, of other 26 crews, they were just worried about John Gambino because he could have, like this, took over. All the other captains would have went in line. He had the power. He had the prestige. He was backed by Sicily, which was a powerhouse at the time. But just John Gambino never wanted it. I, I always wondered why. And I, you're probably one of the guys that can really speak to that. I, I And... and he died not long ago, but but I wonder why did he want the top spot in your opinion? Yeah, I mean that's a good question because he was definitely high profile. I mean he's 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 um, you know traveling back and forth. He has connections to the to the to the big bankers in in uh, Sicily, so yeah. he's got he's got connections to political people there, not just mafiosi. Yeah. Obviously, he's well liked, well respected in the United States too. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I you know, I, I've talked with Frank Panessa before. Have you ever had Frank on your show? I even no, had the, the DA like, agent. And he's somebody that I've been dying to have on, and he's not yeah. super on social media. If you yeah. have a connection, James, I would okay. yeah, yeah, he's he's great. We've we've talked to him a few times. Um, because he knew he knew John. He had he had infiltrated oh, wow. that that crew. And um, you know, his his opinion was that John was was more aloof than than Rosario and Joe. Really, but that but that, but that may have been because Frank was not a made guy. Got it. Frank, Vanessa was obviously you know he was you know so obviously he was undercover, yeah. so he was low rent. You know he was just an associate. Right, right, right. And I think I think that it was it was a more of a, a hierarchical thing that like which is which by the way was smart on the part of John Gambino not right. to. Not to socialize very much with a guy that he doesn't know who yeah. happens to be an undercover. Um, so um, you know, but that's the only real insight I have into his into his personality. So um, but uh, I, I'm just I, I would just guess so you put me on the spot. I would say because obviously he was one of the smartest guys in Cosa Nostra, he might not have wanted the headache. I mean, yeah. maybe, maybe I mean, like, FU money. They were like supposedly right. they were making 300 million a year yeah. on the books. Yeah. With yeah. like a thousand restaurants or whatever they had. Yeah, I, I think I think my, my my guess putting me on the spot would be that he right, he he had the FU money, he had the power, he had the influence, he didn't need to be the boss. Yeah, and yeah. by the way, you, there's less heat and you take less heat, right? Which um yeah, he didn't want the spotlight. Yeah, I see in the I see in the comments. I, I I'm guessing that that's that's why he didn't want he didn't want the heat. And um you know they they had an interesting story too because they eventually you know went down and we actually we actually had a, a we had uh you know your your former colleague John on our yeah. episode recently and uh I asked him about this because in that trial in the 90s Joe and John you know admitted in court that they were they were part of the you know they yeah, took they a plea. Yeah. Right, right and and I always wondered how that went over with John Gotti because you know John Gotti that you know he was really against doing something like that and the, and the old school ways you never do that right you never oh, you know, that was punishable by death in, in the 60s and yeah. 70s easily. right right so um you know and and I think John you, know, you can go back and look at the episode but you know he said that uh, what did he say? Uh, he said bullshit or uh, money talks and bullshit oh, walks. Right, so yeah. his thing was the Jerry Hill Gambinos were on a different different level, like yeah. different, like they, you know they're playing by a different set of rules in a lot of ways because they were such big earners and had so much yep. influence that yep. even if even if God he didn't like it, what was he gonna what was he gonna I, do? He I had his own it. legal problems at that time. I heard and I, I don't, sometimes you, do you know this? There's so you get so much information. You don't know if it's from a book, from a movie. Yeah. You know, now I really develop a good network of sources that give me some really good information. I even have like some like law enforcement contacts that'll throw me a bone, ex law enforcement. So just like yourself, like you put this all together. But I just remember John Gambino would show up at Castellano's house every Christmas with like 300K and a car. And like that was above and beyond his normal kick. So like, I don't know what he gave. I was, I, I should have asked Sammy, I really should have, what John gave. John Gotti every year because I think he gave it to Sammy to give to him and I do remember though I do remember um, 
I think Gotti complained about how much he got from John Gambino because it was like the wives' tales of how much Castellano got. I don't know if you heard any of that, but <laughs> yeah, uh, it doesn't surprise yeah. me. I haven't heard that, but that doesn't surprise me. I mean, I mean that goes back to the addresses the the you know the myth that Cosa Nostra doesn't deal narcotics Correct. and um you don't think paul castellano knew i mean he was related to the cherry hill game <laughs> you don't think he knew and 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 you know there, there's this great moment where like tommy gambino you know his son uh, uh carlo's son yeah where um uh they asked tommy gambino it was um uh i think it was uh, a major newspaper asked him about the cherry hill gambinos and he says he says i don't know who those guys are i'm not really i'm not related to them <laughs> And you know, t- typical like you sort of mafia, like I don't know what you're talking about. I don't see it. And and so obviously, obviously he knew who they were. Obviously, is you know, his dad helped bring them over. Obviously, his cousin Paul Castellano knew. Um, or it was Paul his uncle? I can't remember what the relationship was. But it was Castellano to Tommy Gambino? I can't remember. Yeah. Were they was uncle and nephew or cousins? I can't get confused. Yes, I think, I, think, uh, I think it was uncle. Okay. And, uh, and they were pretty close. They were probably, yeah. They were right. Yeah. So, so the idea that they didn't know that the Cherry Hill Gambinos were major heroin traffickers is, um, you know, I, I just don't buy it. And Angelo Bruno, those all those old school bosses who supposedly had this ban on narcotics, um, I think, I think, what how I would frame it, the way I understand it, is, um, I think there were some guys that they would prefer to not get involved in narcotics because. They didn't trust them. Like John Gambino was a guy who could handle his business. Correct. A guy like Quack Quack, you know, there may be there may be a reason why Paul didn't want him didn't yep. want him and his crew dealing because he's talking on the phone yep. while, while law enforcement is listening. But the idea that there was a universal prohibition on selling narcotics, I think, is is absurd. Which is strange that John mentioned in, in his um, initiation in thirteen, they actually verbalized you can't deal drugs. Jason, who, who supports the show, Jason, I did a plug for the course. I'm going to put a link below if anybody wants to check out the course. Um, he's a, you know, who had generational wealth? Uh, uh, well, obviously, Carlo Gambino's family. Actually, to this day, uh, Tommy Gambino, they gave money to, um, to like, a, a hospital system. There's a Gambino wing. So the Gambinos are gazillionaires. But I do have a funny Paul Castellano son story. Uh, a family friend sells Ferraris. He has two Ferrari dealerships, in um, one in Tampa. Um, the other one is in, I think, uh, Fort Lauderdale. But anyway, it's two Ferrari dealerships. And he fixed Ferraris is up here in Elizabeth, New Jersey. So if something comes in, it's like a nick. I'll fix it, right, for for um, uh, Motor Now, wherever it is, right? And he also sells used Ferraris, that kind of stuff. So I'm there, my brother-in-law, who, had, who bought a car from him. And some guy is, like, on the phone taking delivery of a new new Ferrari. And it's like, he's kind of a jerk. You know, you get a new car. Like, the guy's like, oh, you do this, you do that, you do this. Like, you know, and, like. 20 minutes, right? Let alone buying a Ferrari, you think you would really need to like sit down and whatever. He was on the phone, took delivery of the car, jumped in and sped off. He can care. Like he was picking up a Honda friggin' Accord. It was Paul <laughs> Castellano's son. Oh, <laughs> I, said, I said, these guys got way too much money. But I was picking that up. I, I probably yeah. would have like put it on like a back of a car, like, like, like a flatbed and drove it away because I would have been so scared. Or at three hours on what to do, the Tiptronics and stuff, you know? So yeah, um, that's, that's a funny, a that, funny but that's a good a good point. And there, there's a I mean a good story because there's a parallel to there what you were talking about in Sicily with the upper mafia and the lower mafia. Yeah. The the upper mafia were the guys um who were had infiltrated legitimate businesses, like whether it was whether it was poultry with right. uh Castellano or in Sicily, whether it was construction yeah. right. or, or the or whatever, the citrus market, whatever. Um those guys those guys had a lot more wealth than like the street guys Correct. who were just extortionist and loan sharks. And, you know, um, you know, basically that, I mean, that we all know this, your audience especially knows this, but that's the, that's where John Gotti, that, that was, you know, he was the proletariat, right? He was, right. he was the working class mafiosi, yeah. definitely yeah. what they would call the lower tier mafiosi yeah. versus yeah. the upper, you know, the guys that like were Castellano, um, you know, those guys, I, I think, accumulated a lot more wealth than the street guys. Well, supposedly, uh, uh, there was a rift between the Sicilians and Albanans and the Gambino family. And supposedly, John Gotti goes, thank God you're, you're one of us, meaning Albanan. 
I'm probably allowed to correct him because now I'm actually slain. So he had a uh, guy to legitimately eat some crow. All right, <laughs> because because your time's valuable, we're, we're gonna we're gonna spend a few more minutes. But I want to go over a few more things before we wrap sure. up. So, so obviously, if you have any questions, drop them below, and James can check out the comments. I'll, I'll put a link to the Original Gangsters podcast. They have the best mafia podcast in the world, Thank not you. just the U.S. in the world. Um, okay, Bruno Carbone was a Camarista, um who was with Raphael Imperiali, and he got caught in Syria. And this is where it gets a little murky in an area either protected by ISIS the Syrian government and or both, right? And he was kind of a, a protege of theirs. He was being like kind of whisked through and he says he was like a Mexican on the run. He was a political prisoner, but he turned out to be Bruno Carbone and he turned out to um, be protected by ISIS. We always kind of knew the Camorra link uh, on the MDMA, the pill market, but this kind of fortifies that. So just hearing a little bit, I don't know if you were familiar with the case, but hearing what I shared with you, what do you think about like kind of the Camorra and actually dealing with terrorism? Terrorism. Uh, yeah, I mean it doesn't it doesn't surprise me. Uh, I mean we know there were those kinds of links even in the in the seventies uh, and eighties with uh, in terms of arms trafficking. At the time, right. it was with Italian groups, Camorra and Cosa Nostra. Right. Even with uh, at that point, it was like uh, Eastern European yeah. um, groups coming out of like Bulgaria and yeah. Albania and places like that. So yeah. it's not like this would be totally unprecedented yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and it's not like they have like some kind of like ethical code against that and it's you know it's just it's not that far from yeah. italy really you know really yeah. when you think about it, in terms of geography and also in those kinds of um uh you know what we would call in in, in political science or criminology ungoverned spaces crime groups international crime groups thrive in those kinds of Correct. environments where you really don't have a central state um, that can hold it down. And, yep. and there's a sense of lawlessness, you know, it's perfect for trafficking contraband, you know, um, whether it's weapons, drugs, people. I mean, we know that the Italian mafia groups are getting more and more into human trafficking. So a lot of the, a lot of the human trafficking is coming out of North Africa. So, I mean, we know there are, there are terror cells there. I, I'm again, I'm, I'm speculating. I don't, I don't you know, want people to say that I, I, when I came out and said that, but yeah. it wouldn't surprise me if that's another, uh, area where there's this kind of um, overlap between organized crime groups and and um, and terrorism. Well, his boss Raphael Imperiali was the boss of that Camorra clan, and he was interesting because he was in Dubai. He partnered with the Kinahan clan and the Macro Mafia out of the Netherlands. And it's funny, not funny, but I had Anna Sergi on Dr. Anna Sergi, and I, I I try to picture on like the the um super cartel concept that she kind of like like poo pooed me a little bit. yeah yeah that yeah i know that yeah <laughs> she's like, yeah she's like yeah. she basically, she basically like politely called me an idiot and then like yeah. later on she's like all the dragon is forming all these different and i'm like oh the super cartel she, she didn't appreciate the joke see that's why yeah. you know this you lose a little bit in the italian and italian american there is a little bit of loss in translation and kind of like you yeah, weren't I, and I think I think what she, if I recall, what, what her point, I think she was pushing back against you saying this is it's just globalization. It's, it's correct, more correct. like right that, that uh, this has been going on for a long time, more than like a a super cartel. Yeah, um, no, just, just like, I'm like a big fan of hers. And oh, yeah, so am I. Yeah, down, and like I kind of wanted to cry. No, all right. Yeah, so, we I've I've emailed with her and, and she's she says she'll come on our show at some point, but it's it's you know how it is with her. It's difficult it's coordinating the schedule because there's a time difference and. She's, she's extraordinarily busy. <laughs> so she did some, it like her, you know, Italian take off the whole month of respect. Yeah. She's great. Um, she did it from, I believe, from her vacation. I was really appreciative. And sure. she also um, knew of where my brother in law was from in, uh, mm. in uh, Calabria and knew their surnames as well. So, like, it's kind of like she was big on surnames. So she kind of knew of them, which is pretty cool. So, sure. kind of, let's kind of shift over to Calabria before we close. Um, I'm really my new and we all have our rabbit holes and I'd love to hear what your current rabbit hole is. I'm just really stuck on how the Calabria Mafia turned from a kidnapping organization to a 50 billion dollar powerhouse that, in my opinion, exceeds the cartels in wealth, maybe not power, but wealth. Right. And while the U.S. calls in Austria is probably at best five families, probably the neighborhood of about a half a billion. 
Um, the Sicilian Cosa Nostra, probably about $5 billion. The Camorra, maybe about $20 billion. Um, But, so, for example, the crime groups in, the Calabrian crime groups in Canada are, are striving. In Australia are striving. In Calabria, striving. Germany, Luxembourg, wherever, right? So what I'm getting at is the, the consistent part is they're Calabrian, Italian, but the other crime groups are not faring as well. So my current rabbit hole, and I'd like you to weigh in, is why is a Calabrian mafia, like, hockey sticking? why other organizations that are Italian and Italian descent are falling by the wayside. Yeah, well I think I think a, a lot of it has to do with the the the, the problem of like Totorina uh generating so much attention and, and the state, a concerted effort by the state um to to crack down, especially after the assassination of Falcone and uh who is his colleague, Borsellino. Um you know yeah. uh, um so the so the Cosa Nostra really was taking a lot of hits and then and then similar with john gotti well there i know that there was the five families trial even before gotti but i think in a lot of ways it's it's a vacuum you know i think cosa nostra in both countries italy and the united states um really really took a hit and i think in a lot of ways it was it was um a vacuum because i I know when you when you read like the literature about cosa nostra in sicily during the 50s 60s 70s 80s they really look down on the on the Calabrese. The Calabrese. Right. They them as farmers, you know. <laughs> they, right. They, they 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 view them as junior, very much junior partners. Correct. Right, right. uh, and that, that that's definitely not so that's definitely changed. Because one of his uh, bridesmen, uh, one of his groomsmen, was a heavy hitter from them, and I think Rena was smart enough to know, hey, we're more powerful than these guys right now, but these guys are not fucking around. And, yeah. And um and actually, I think he. Uh, uh, I think it would have been John Panisi's show where he said they went over. I think what's his name? Battle of Menti attempted to go over to the Calabrians for help, but they were tied in Marina already. Oh, yeah. that yeah, I didn't know that, but yeah, I would say like um, one thing you know that I that I think is I, is very difficult for me to sort out because I'm not an expert on the on the Calabrians. Is yeah. you you have guys in um, like Canada who are. Um, Calabrian, yeah. but they're not necessarily Andragata. Like, in, in yeah, some the, of, there's you know, uh, the, 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 I think the Lupino, right, right, uh, Ano, right, and another clan are um, Calabrian, but then the Camisos are. Yeah, it's very strange. Yeah, it, it's difficult. And then, and then you have uh, Violi, uh, oh. Violi, who's Calabrian, who's connected to those guys, but he's Cosa Nostra. He was Cosa Nostra, and always, <laughs> and always was, and always was. That's why. And then, then you kind of got like. Buffalo sneaking in and is like, is Indraga to getting their little heels and like in their their kind of paws into that? There's there's a lot like guys, you guys need to watch original gangsters. If you think like just because the social club is closed, if you think the mafia is dead, um, that's what they want you to think. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And and I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised that, and I could be wrong. You know, yeah. we can come back and look at this in a few years. Yeah. And if my yeah. prediction is wrong, that's fine. But it wouldn't surprise me if families Cosa Nostra families in the United States start making guys from Calabria who yep. are related to yep. the the um Andragata, but not not um you know actual members but related to those guys yep. and that and that and you could have this uh, uh another version of this transatlantic correct you know like you had with the Castellamarese and and, yeah. and the Gambinos and Palermo but now it could be it could be uh, a transatlantic Thing between U.S. Cosa Nostra and Calabria, uh, I, it wouldn't surprise me. I think um, I agree and I disagree. I, I agree that's going to happen. I disagree. I think Indragata set up shop here and is going to set up shop and is going to be like a seventh family. Oh um, yeah, that the U.S. is just not going to be. They're not, but they're not going to get involved with street stuff. They're going to bring you know fentanyl induced drugs here to the U.S. through Canada. They'll maybe sell to LCN, maybe sell to Distro, maybe a middleman, if you will. Um, but I think they're going to remain on their own because that's their power. You remember, because remember, you got to be family, right? The Calabrian. Yeah. So yeah. I agree with you. I just think the structure is going to be different. Um, yeah. but one, one last thing, and I remember um, when I partnered with John on the, the NBA and Button Man, I was doing my research, and I, I, I just was never, I, don't, I just was never as knowledgeable on the Lucchese's. It's like yeah. the Korean War, like it was important, but you don't remember it. You know what I mean? Like, it's, I don't mean to, I don't mean to yeah. Anybody who served in any way, I'm just saying sure. like, contextually, like they're important in players. I just didn't know much about them, right? So when I was doing my research in 20, 2020, 2021, 
I was like, all right, let me check this out. A lot of guys in Lucchese's are on the street. Like, if they're 115, I think they might only have, like, 10 in jail serving, like, long stints. So, like, what I'm saying is, like, and that's just Lucchese's. So, in my opinion, even the five families are somewhat formidable um, in that sense. A lot of guys on the street, they're making money. Um, Anastasia always says, uh, make money, not headlines. Um, let's wrap Let's wrap it up maybe on the five families, even Detroit, which is your bailiwick. What do you think about current day cause in Austria here in the U.S.? Yeah, I think uh, I just talked to a good source in New York the other day, and, and he said the Colombos are pretty much have fallen on, on hard times. But yeah. the other families are, um, you know, pretty – still pretty formidable and especially the Gambinos like um, th yeah. they have these um, still these strong international connections more yeah. so than the other families. I think the West side guys are still strong. Obviously the Bonanos right now are, are I would say this kind of dysfunctional yeah. moment with, with Mancuso, but, um, but I still, I definitely think Genovese and, and Gambinos and Lucchese are, are still very, very formidable uh, here in Detroit. There's, there's not much left. Um, you know, there's a there's a there's a debate on some of these online forums. There's guys who are like, no, the mafia doesn't exist in Detroit anymore. That that's not true. I can I can tell you that's not yeah. true. Um, but it's not what it once was. Um, uh, I think it's uh, probably a dozen or fewer guys at this point. Yeah, they're worth wide like four hundred million. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's what I mean. It, and so it doesn't mean when I say that I don't mean to people to think that 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 means they're any less dangerous or any less well, uh, you know, um, affluent. Uh, but it's certainly not what it was, you know, in, in, even in the '90s or, or the '80s. But there's still a, there's still a few guys around. Um, but uh, and you know, obviously Philadelphia, Boston, Buffalo. But uh, yeah, other than that, you know, I'm not sure. We just did an episode that dropped this week about Kansas City. There's not much left in Kansas City. Yeah. I'd say maybe it seems like a half a dozen guys yeah. left. And again, doesn't mean that they're not they're not dangerous, yeah. wealthy dudes. Yeah. Yeah. But at this point, they're 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 basically it's not so much a, a hierarchy with an administration. It's mo basically a network of guys that work with other ethnic crime groups right, at this right. point, you know, cause that's where the, that's where the soldiers are. You know, yeah. that's the, that's the thing that New York has an advantage is they still have these thriving Italian communities with a recruiting pool. Um, yeah. And uh, well, maybe not what it used to be, but definitely more so than more so than like Detroit, you know, right. where you, right. you, right. it's, it's, um, you know, uh, the, the way I put it is, um, you know, turn like, white people or Italians in, in the Detroit area are for all intent and purpose, white people, yeah. you know? yeah. <laughs> they totally assimilated. And, you know, you don't have as, you really don't have like ethnic enclaves anymore. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. people go to college and, you know, um, it's not like the environment where like John Gotti was recruited from, you know, like a very yeah. like, uh, you know, well, I, I went to, real quick, speaking of, yeah. um, I don't even cut you off, but speaking of um, the Sicilians, I went to Il Coliseo, which is Lorenzo Menino's spot. Um, wow. Um, for, for, uh, I went there, um, about a year and a half ago and I went with my, not my wife, my fiance, we actually had to go to Brooklyn to pick up some shirts for the show, the old show. And, um, I'm like, it's my, and I used to eat there when I didn't even know it was this place. Right. So I'm like, we got to go there. You know, we we're doing, I was doing the NBA button man at the time, but I'm like, no, 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 this guy's like, I had no clue who I am. So I should be fine. They so go eat there, had a spectacular meal. Right. Cafe Sorrento's next door, which is, I text John, I'm like, could I go in there? He's like, they're not going to bother you. Um, uh, and John's like, that's a Gambino Cafe. So I go in there, we get an espresso, Lorenzo Bonino walks in. Wow. Wow. <laughs> like, you know, and, and I know, like, I'm nobody, I'm a super nobody, but like <laughs> the 1% chance, like, you know, because John used to bring up uh, Tall Pete all the time. So I'm like, yeah. Jesus, he maybe, maybe like have an idea of like, so like, so I get served espresso in a paper cup. So now I'm shitting because like I text John, I'm like, I got espresso served in a paper cup. Does this mean get out of it? You know how you yeah. know how are. You yeah, know subtle, it's, right? It's like here you go, right, yeah. right. But no, that's how they serve everybody. So I had my espresso. Of course, my um, my uh, fiance had to pee. I'm like, can you pee outside? I don't care. <laughs> we got to get out of here. <laughs> she goes and pees. She goes, no, I'm peeing inside. She goes and pees. And you'll appreciate this. It's an Italian cafe. They had six different, not only motion censored um, uh, cameras, but actually had like light and heat sensors. So like if it was dark, it could still see. Yeah, still records. I'm just sitting there, and I got I got to give Lorenzo credit because um, uh, he paid five dollars on a two dollar espresso. I thought that was a boss move, and I know some people fumped to it at this. So like, 
not to name drop, like it wouldn't matter. But yeah, I'm just saying, I know some Paisan of his. So like, you know, like if he, you know, if I'm staring at the end of a barrel, I maybe could last three more minutes. But <laughs> yeah, he's, I mean, uh, you know, the people that I talk to either who were in the life or who still That's are in the life, he's That's a very true. popular guy, very well liked, well respected. Yeah. And they, they say he's a throwback, like he does it the right way. So, you know, we'll see. Well, obviously, you know, Anytime you're near the top or at the top, you're going to draw attention. But he seems to be, you know, doing it the old school way, which is like you said, make make money, not headlines, or or it was George's term. But I, I I've heard that too. All right, That's uh, a good story. We're going to wrap up. Feel free. How can James? How? Because I know there's a few different ways. How can people find you? Find the podcast, etc. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I co-host Original Gangsters Podcast with Scott Bernstein. You can find us on Spotify, Apple uh, Podcast, Google Podcast. And we have a video version now on YouTube. So just Gangster Podcast. Um, please, you know, follow us on, on social media, um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I did uh, shameless self-promotion. If you are interested in Detroit, I, I wrote a book about the early Detroit mafia, the early 1900s stuff where um, a lot of it in here is about my family, the Bucciolato family and, and oh, yeah. um, the, the Bonanos, right? Bon, Bonventre, Magadinos. And then some of the, and then obviously a lot of Tocos are really stuff too. So, um, and uh, you know, other than that, uh, you know, thanks for having me on. I, I appreciate your patience time because we've known each other for a while, but uh, you know, with our schedules, it hasn't always been easy to, to, yeah. to get the stars aligned. Right. So I appreciate your patience and I appreciate you inviting me on. It was, it was fun. It's my pleasure. It's going, can you get that on audio by chance or not yet? The Detroit uh, one? uh, I'm not sure. Um, it's, Actually, I'm embarrassed. I, I don't know. It might be. I, I don't know. I'd have to I'm look. I'm like an too. audible guy now because I'm like, sure. Hey, no, I understand. It like, can be convenient. Yeah. Yeah. Walking a lot. So I, that's when I listen to my books. Right? Sure. Let me just see Detroit and B U C C. Yeah. If you just uh, Google it, you know, Detroit Mafia with my last name, the book will come up. You can find it on Amazon or. Okay. Well, either way, if not, oh, oh, oh Bernstein's book comes up on uh, on on audio. You know, yeah, he wrote I'll, he wrote the forward for my book. Beautiful. Get me the um, give me the link when you get a chance. I'll promote it and I'll buy a book myself because I would love to read it. Love your stuff. And then James, thank you so much for being on the Armstrong NBA. Yeah, thanks, guys. Have a good evening.